keys to do the same. You hold redemption. Made accusers drop their stones. Showed us mercy. With your mighty miracles, now there's breakthrough. Now there's freedom in your name. You gave us power. Lord, 
the Lord. Can we thank him today? Can we thank him for the Holy Ghost? Hallelujah. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, can you thank him for sending, sending you to a Holy Ghost filled church this morning to get the Holy Ghost? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He's worthy. My God. Hallelujah. Woo. I love what I feel. Praise the Lord. Mm. <laughs> Ooh. You know, if I'd have came in here and praised and worshiped like I felt, I'd have sat over that corner like a bump on a log. We had some preaching saying we don't come in here by feelings. Regardless of how we feel, God is still God. Thank God that he's still God no matter how I feel. He's still ready to do something in this place. My God. Turn around. Shake hands if you want or bump fists. Wave at somebody across the way. Whatever you feel like doing. <laughs> it is so good to see each and every one of you in the house of God. What did you come expecting this morning? Did you come expecting anything? <laughs> I come expecting God to change some things in my life. I don't know about you. I told the Lord in the prayer room, God, change the way I think. Change the way I walk with you. Change, I've been walking with you for the last four years. Change that. Change it to a different way. I want a different walk in the Spirit. Come on. What would you expect this morning? What, what's your ex expectations for God? I walked in the prayer room, and I tell you, it hit me. I felt sick in my body. Felt like I couldn't touch God. Woo! And I've, I've learned when things like that start happening, especially when you get in the prayer room, we're on the right track, church. We're doing something right. We can't give in to those things. We've got to push forward. God, I want to change my ways, Lord. Change me. I'm talking to myself right now. I want to change my ways. My God. Woo. I'm telling you, I felt something break earlier on that course. My God. I feel good. I think God's going to do something. I want to I wanna, I wanna touch something right quick. It just kept, it keeps beating me in my mind. It keeps hitting me. You know, we, 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 as humans, we do make mistakes. We're not exempt. We may be filled with the Holy Ghost, but we're not exempt from making mistakes or falling. Sometimes we slip, but a lot of times we stay in that wet grass and we make a mud hole of it. That's not God's will. And I'm not saying it's, it's, it's free to go out and, and live the way you want, but conviction and repentance is one thing, but condemnation is a totally other. And I feel like some people are being condemned this morning. 
I keep, uh, condemnation keeps hitting me. I'm telling you, I'm, the, I'm number one. I, I, I know how to whip on myself. I know how to grab that whipping post and go to beating. That's not God's will. Huh. The fact that you're battling something, you keep repenting over it, is letting you know that you, you feel conviction over it. Keep, keep going to God with it. Don't just for it and say, well, I don't need to do anything about that. That's when you need to worry. Somebody here, the devil has been pouring condemnation on you and you have been beating yourself. God says it stops this morning. He's ready. The spirit besides whipping on yourself. There's been some things, there's been things around you, people around you that's been whipping on you. God, go away. Change my walk. Change my. Let's worship the Lord together today. Praise the Lord.
Well, hallelujah, Lord, we praise you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, we praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I like what I feel here this morning. Thank you, Lord. Did you come for a spiritual renewing this morning? Amen. Praise God. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Amen. Do you believe he answers prayer? Amen. Yes, he does. Let's lift up Bertha Dietz this morning. Amen. Also, Sister Bushnell is in need of a touch. Bobby Chesson. Amen. Let's lift him up. Also, Veronica Walker, Wanda Chesson as well. Amen. There are several needs. If you have a special unspoken, signify those by the raising of your hands. Amen. Amen. We have several needs here, but we know that God is more than able. Amen. If you need prayer this morning, we want you to come forward. Amen. Believing that God will touch you. Amen, and we will pray over you. Join me in taking these needs to God this morning. Lord Jesus, we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory here today. We lift you up, God, and we magnify your name. Lord, we bring every need here before you, whether spoken or unspoken. We know that you know the needs, Lord. And we also know that you are more than able to meet any need, Lord, whether it's the healing of our bodies, Lord, whether it's touching of our minds or our hearts, Lord God, reaching those lost souls, those lost loved ones, Jesus, we know that there is nothing that you can't do. Oh, hallelujah, Lord, we place all of our needs before you, Jesus, trusting in you, Lord and God. Oh, we love you today, Jesus, hallelujah, Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Amen. Everybody shout in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated as our ushers come forward to assist with tithes and offerings this morning. Amen. Praise the Lord. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for all you do. Lord, we ask that you bless these tithes and offerings and all that are here. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, amen. How many of you know when God walks in the room, just everything, everything changes. There's a peace that can come over you like no other peace you've ever known. You walk 
into the room. Sickness starts to vanish and every hopeless situation ceases to exist when you walk into the room. The dead begin to rise and stay. Give him glory in this place. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Just lift up your hands and praise him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I glorify your name, Jesus. I glorify your name, Lord. You are worthy. You are worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's something very contagious about a winner. A winner always walks around with his shoulders elevated and his chest or her chest, they just got a certain stance about them. Their demeanor is radiated with confidence. Amen. Their, their stamina is 
well deserved and accomplished and achieved by the rigid schedule of training that they have performed. They don't walk into the arena. They do not walk onto the field. They do not walk into the ring with a, a demeanor of defeat. They're, they're not there thinking they were going to lose. They're not there with the mentality that, man, if I could only get through this. And man, I got to tell you, when I come to church, I come to church victory. I come to church winning. I, I, I come to church with the mentality, amen, that I am triumphant by the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, somebody's not here a minute today. I've had, I've had too many funerals lately. Hey Amen. I, I, you didn't even invite me, but I've been burying a bunch of your friends, obviously. You come to church dead. You come to church that you, you, you're letting your circumstance, you're letting your life, you're letting your work, you're letting your family, you're letting your problems dictate your level of participation and the smile or the frown upon your face. Honey, I don't know about you, but when God filled me with the Holy Ghost, I became a winner. I come to service a winner. I rejoice a winner. I pray as a winner because my God is everlasting. Woo! Now, 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 Pastor, you've been defeated lately. No, I haven't. No, I have it. What, what, didn't you? Didn't you have a virus? I did. I'm proud to tell you that I did. He said, "Well, why are you proud? Because I can't get it for four months." They said. <laughs> they had pneumonia. I had it. You had a rough time. I had it. But I'm still a champion. I'm still a winner. You, you show me a champion that ever gets involved in the ring and doesn't have cuts and bruises and wounds. You show me a champion that, that steps into a ring and he's in a battle and though he's triumphant and though he's victorious and though he wins, it doesn't mean that he's coming out that he's perfect and everything's flawless. No scratch, no blood, no bru No, my God, I gotta tell somebody that every day you're gonna be in a battle, you're gonna be on a battlefield, but when you come to the ring of Jesus Christ, uh, I was glad when they said it to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I'm preaching a little bit, but I'm just going to wear you out. Now, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you. Our visitors, close your ears for a moment. This is a perfect church. Now, cl cl close your ears and let me tell the truth. Some of you folks ain't getting it. Been in church and filled with the Holy Ghost and living for God many years. Folks staying home because they tired. That's the definition of stupidity. Folks staying home because they, they're, they're over blessed. I, I'm just going, I hope they're listening on the internet. I'm man enough to tell it in the pulpit and I'm man enough to tell it in their face. I'm not no politician. I'm here for the saving of a soul of a man and a woman and a child. I'm here to tell you what it takes to get you to the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm fixing to start praying the way that the Bible tells me to pray. I'm going to start praying that God just takes away your stuff because some folks are too blessed and they got to work extra to keep all their stuff and they're too tired to come to the house of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not out for your vote today. But I'm going to tell you what, when I come to church, I don't want to come to a depressing place. Ah, now you can be tired. I'm not against that. I get tired too. You know, obviously, I'm tired of some things this morning. <laughs> well, we should. They're so sweet. <laughs> They're so nice, man. They just love on you and all that. Man, why we can't have one of them today? <laughs> Amen, because they're not going to take the belt out and give it to you when you need it. I'm going to tell you. Some of you tired and weary and can't pray and worse because you can barely make it in the prayer room. And when you do pray, you just go to the prayer room for a minute or two and walk around and don't really touch heaven. 
Let me tell you the truth. You got enough hell in your life that you're murmuring and complaining over it all and you're not putting it at the altar and dealing with it in prayer and being spiritual about it. You so, you so confident in pointing fingers and running everybody else down and you can't get your life straight. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost today, hey, church, if we're going to have revival, you got to press through the spirit and the adversity and you got to get to the place where you make up your mind, we're here to have church. I am here victorious today. I never did like them. And folk, I, I've listened to them testify. I love our elders, but I had somewhat against thee. Not you today, but when I was growing up in church. Now folks get up and testify. I, I don't know what Bible they're reading. Pray for me, pastor. I was, I was barely able to get to church today. Pray for me that I make heaven. I'm struggling. And hey, Listen to me. Listen to me. We can pray in confidence. We can pray in private. We can counsel in private. But when we come collectively to worship the Lord, this is not the time to come and have your pity party. God's not in trouble. God's not, he's not loaded with problems and overwhelmed by, by your, your, your activities or your endeavors or your cancellations or your problems. I told somebody today, uh, well, yesterday, actually I was talking to, to someone, I believe it was yesterday, and uh, all them days run together when you get old. <laughs> Some of you must be old. I heard a lot of confirmations. And I said, well, let me share something with you. Hot shot, who was a pastor. I said, you think that 2020 and the coronavirus caught God by surprise, or do you think that God knew all about it from the start? Now, you know, pastors are human. He said, you know, I never thought about that. <laughs> Listen to me. Don't come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday defeated. That's not the will of God. Your Holy Ghost is not working. You know, I'll tell you the truth. Holy Ghost is not working because you're not tapping into the Holy Ghost. Some of you need a good old-fashioned praying through. Oh, uh, I know, I know. Y'all want me? To, I, I know. Y'all want me to read my scripture? He'll make you the head, and not the tail. I preach there too. <laughs> I'm gonna pass right on through that one because <laughs> turn around and love on somebody. I love you. I'm just gonna tell you. The number of people does not constitute your victory. The number of absentees does not constitute your victory or your defeat. The people that are here are absent do not constitute your victory or your defeat. The songs that are being singing, what anointing, what great job, what awesomeness that is up here. Great people doing an awesome job. Amen. But I'm going to tell you, they do not constitute my victory. My victory was constituted back when he was carrying an old rugged cross to Calvary, amen, and laid his life down for my old sins. Yeah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God. In sickness, I am victorious. Amen, in my weakness, I'm strong. Turn to your neighbor and say, it's Bible. Say, put a smile on your face. Turn to your other neighbor and say, fake it till you make it. That's Bible. I prove that. Well, where we want to go today? I got a lot of sermon today. Let me take you to Revelations. Let's do that. Boy, you ain't ready. You better get your steel toe boots. Amen. Revelations chapter 4 and then Revelations chapter 5 that did not update on the software. Click again. Click a couple of times and then we'll back up. There we go. It was all moved but it went back and it was saved. So there's a conflict between me and PowerPoint. 
but I've got the victory. Amen, because when my PowerPoints ain't right and I all messed up, amen, we still going to worship the Lord. Amen. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2 through 5, then we'll drop down to 10 and 11, and then we'll turn to chapter. I will read more than I am accustomed to, and we'll preach longer than I normally do, maybe, or not. If I preach short, then you'll be fired up. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone and there was rainbow round about the throne and the sight likened to an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightning and thunder and voices, and there were seven lamps and fire burning before the throne, which were the seven spirits of God. Verse 10, And the four and twenty elders fall down before him and sat on the throne and worshipped him that lived forever and ever and cast their Crown before the throne saying thou art worthy everybody say worthy O Lord to receive glory and honor and power for thou hast created all things for thy pleasure they are and were created John is translated he's puzzled at what's transpiring because he's checking in and out and he's not sure if it's spiritual or if he actually been transferred physically he's seeing some things that he had never heard before and he's witnessing some things that he had never even imagined and then there 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 is this puzzling question mark that lingers that is soon to be answered in chapter 5 about who is worthy it is mandated that there is to be a book to be open but there obviously in the council of the 24 elders and the four beasts that were sitting upon the throne were puzzled and they hear this this question mark in John who is getting the revelation or is getting the vision and I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah the root of David hath prevailed to open the book and to have to loose the seven seals thereof. I want to preach to you this morning. We'll be all over and I hope that I can get you to where we need to be. I earnestly sought the Lord. I earnestly conveyed with God to eliminate my thoughts my impressions and my feelings and while some of my frustration to see you in defeat in our services are bled from my flesh this message is bled from the spirit there's a difference I want to preach to you today with the help of the Lord and the spirit of God on the simplicity of the title worthy worthy and turn to your neighbor and say there's only one worthy what a mighty God we serve would you put your Bible down and lift up your hands oh God we need you today we need you we need your help we need your strength we need your power come on touch him for just a moment touch him oh God help us to have revelation God 
Help us to move in the spirit today, God. We need you today. We need you, Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus, smile real big and turn to your neighbor, someone you have not spoken to, and tell them it's going to be all right. God bless you, and you may be seated. I am not elated, nor am I overwhelmed with zeal and charisma to elevate in prayer or praise or worship because it is an emotional journey of thrill. However, all of my human essence, I bow down to God by prayer and praise and worship because God is mightier than I am. He is greater than I am. Let me give you another hint you forgot. You help me preach, I preach faster. You don't help me preach, I go slow and I take my time. You don't believe me, try me. My allegiance belongs to God. He is your everything and he is my everything. I adulate, honor, or maybe some of you may not adulate but may agitate God. I adulate God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. My worship to God is not passive and seldom. Well, we'll work till we get an amen. I got all day. My worship to God is not Passive and seldom, but very much intentional. My worship to God is not by accident, but it is on purpose. That when I lift up my hands, it is just not my flesh lifting it up, but it is an intention of my heart, mind, soul, and strength to glorify the name of the Lord. Often to worship and regular to worship and repetitive to worship is my called duty and responsibility, not as a human, but as a born again saint of God, as a Holy Ghost tongue talking, one God revelation, Jesus name baptized saint of God. I am ushered in to worship. Uh, I am called and mandated by the word of God to give my allegiance and my ability and my energy to magnify the name of the Lord. Mm. Now, 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 let me help you. You cannot frown and magnify God at the same time. You can't be defeated and lift up and glorify and magnify God at the same time. Your worship must derive from your revelation. Your worship must come out of your relationship and your born again experience with God. When you come to the throne room of God in worship, you are bringing not your troubles, not your problems, but you are bringing the strength of God. You are bringing the triumph of God. You are bringing every accomplished mission of God. And when you lift up your hands, it's not what you had happen this week or last week or not last month. It's not not what you're going through it's not what you're feeling it's not your emotional that that goes back and forth it is the wisdom and the revelation that this true God has all power and he has all might in the palm of his hands A.W. Tozer said I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God, that any man or woman on this earth who is bored 
and turned off by worship is not heaven ready. If my worship offends you, heaven offends you. If my, my verbal praise and accolades granted unto God disturbs you, everything about God disturbs you. If the clapping is too loud and it disturbs you, heaven is too loud and will disturb you. If singing is not your thing, then heaven is not your thing. If shouting and dancing and edifying and glorifying God is not your thing or your cup of tea, I've got to tell you today with sadness, heaven is not designed for you, but heaven is designed for his bride. Heaven is designed for those that have an experience and a revelation of who God is. When you worship God, there is not a statement that you can make that will overemphasize him. He is the almighty God. Francis Shane said, isn't it a comfort to worship a God? We cannot exaggerate. In your verbiage and your ability to have great and grand phraseology, in your skill to be able to speak uh, authoritatively, in your best effort, you cannot over glorify God. In your verbiage and your intelligent capability of quoting or citing some of the most fascinating words in the encyclopedia or the dictionary. They have no match for the glory of God. They come from human intelligence. Uh, they are created by our best ability to give a survey or an appraisal of who God is. Uh, amen. But there are often limitations in my humanity. There are often limitations in your humanity to express the goodness of God. And so when the verbiage or the phraseology or the words do not flow, it is converted into a sound of worship and praise. It is then that you echo with us and make a joyful noise unto the Lord. It is then when your words are short it is then when your vocabulary is at a period. It is then when your phraseology is limited that you go to worship and you move with all your heart, mind, soul, and spirit to glorify God, to lift up God, to exalt God. Worship is in your genetic makeup. It is in your DNA to honor and to glorify God. You were designed to worship. Oh, I wish I had all my strength and energy right now. I'd rock the house today. Amen. I was designed to worship God. It's not a matter of if you will worship. It is a matter of who you will worship and what you will worship. God does not force you to serve him. God does not impose upon you that when you come to my church that it is knowing to you that it is instant to worship God. God does not arrest you. He doesn't twist your hand behind your back and mandate you to worship him. He, however you are designed to worship, you will make a choice. Joshua 24 said, choose ye this day whom ye will serve. It is a decision that every young person must make. It is a decision that every adult must make. Amen. But you will serve something. And when you serve something, you will give it your effort. You will give it your energy. You will give it your time. You will give it your best to be able to please that which you are serving. Jesus is walking and he said it, it, it's urgent and it's mandated in chapter 4. He meant that, I, that uh, I, I come to the city of Samaria or called Sychar. He makes his journey there to a well. He sends his disciples into the city. He is with a Samaritan woman there that came to draw water at the well. And Jesus said, woman, 
fetch me something or draw me something to drink. She begins to converse with this Jew, a Samaritan and a Jew that was not cultural appropriate at that moment. And uh, she begins to convey to Jesus that uh, it's not uh, likely, it's not properly for me to draw drink. Jesus twists the channel or the turns the table to move it to a spiritual lesson. He says, woman, if you draw out of this well, you will thirst again. But I've got some water that you can draw out of that you will never, ever thirst again. And she looks at Jesus according to the scripture and says, give me of this well that you speak of, this living water that I may not return back to Jacob's territory, Jacob's well, something that had been paid for many, many generations before. She begins to draw the cord of religion before Jesus halts her in her tracks. She begins to make uh, attention to her walk with God. She begins to use phrases that would allude her to Christianity, if you please. But Jesus begins, and he uses this word, I perceive. He begins to sever the cord of religion and relationship with this woman. This woman begins to use the phrase that uh, my father's uh, worshiped in the mountain. I have a lintage of spirituality. I, I've been doing this a long time, but yet I want to tell you that there was just at the threshold of a breakthrough for this woman that was going to have a spiritual encounter that would transform her life for eternity. Jesus begins to bring to her attention where she is at in life. He says, go and get your husband. She says, I have no husband. And Jesus begins to say, rightfully so. And he quotes the other five and begins to bring to her attention. She said, I perceive you're a prophet. But yet when it is all said and done, Jesus begins to tell her yet that there was a, a generational religion that she was tied to. It was worshiping of her forefathers at the heels of Abraham. It was the Samaritan temple that had been ruined right about 156 B.C. that she was referring to and reflecting to in her worship. She was lingering and she was reaching back to someone's relationship with God and she was tying a bow upon her connection to someone else's relationship. I want to tell you that you your mama might have worshipped your grandma might have served God your great grandpa might have been in truth but it is not adequate enough for you to say oh papa was apostolic it does not make you anything apostolic because papa had the Holy Ghost because great papa had the gift of the spirit of God on the inside of him there must be an infilling of the Holy Ghost with revelation in each and every one of us her, her lack of revelation bled out in her convey of religion and her abandonment of relationship. Many quote religion. I Pentecostal. I'm apostolic. I go to my church. We make reference to our background of worship. But there must be something bled on the inside of us. And Jesus said, ye worship, ye know not, is what he was conveying to the Samaritan woman. You're tied into to tradition. You're tied into religion. You're tied into customs. But there's never been an individual walk with God. There's never been an individual relationship with God. But woman, today, if you're willing to drink of the well, of salvation if you're willing to listen to the gospel if you're willing to get a hold there's a place that you're going
you're going to worship, it's not going to be in Samaria. It's not going to be in Jerusalem. But it's a place that you will worship in the spirit and in truth. I make a plea to this congregation today that you worship the Lord. It's not limited to my church. You worship to God. It's not limited to the wells or the walls of prayer room. You worship to God. It's a daily event. It's a daily activity. It's whether I'm in my church, I'm worshiping God. Whether I'm in my car, I'm worshiping God. Whether I'm in my house, I'm worshiping God. The problem is, is that we only participate in worship when we come to the house of God and we fight demons in hell when we go to our home because we do not worship God in spirit and truth on a daily basis. It must be an intention to worship the Lord. And let me, let me just kind of move on here today. We know who we worship. We know we worship the one true God. Let me lay that foundation today. We worship the mighty God. We're not worshiping Buddha. We're not worshiping the wealthy God. We're not worshiping the on-time God and the spare tire God. We're not worshiping the God that answers when I pray that my fingernail was shattered and I need him to replace my fingernail. We're not worshiping a God, amen, that today I feel good and if the paycheck says I'm doing good and my checking account says I'm doing good, I'm fine and fancy to go on Sunday to worship God. But if things are a little rough, I'll show God. If, if there's something that doesn't meet your standard, if there is, uh, let me tell you, worship is not tied into economics. Uh, worship is not tied into social status. Worship is not tied into your feel good emotion. Worship is tied into revelation and relationship. The one true God. And when I come to this place, all my weakness is strong. When I come to this place, all my troubles are abandoned. When I come to this place, all of my problems disappear. Why? Because I'm coming to glorify and to magnify and to worship the one true God. That's why you have victory. That's why you're a champion. That's why you have revelation because you can walk in the shadows. The day I walk through the shadows of death, I want to tell you, I have no fear. Why? Revelation. Turn to your neighbor and say, Revelation. And so, yea, though you walk through the shadows of death, when you're in that valley and you don't understand, there's a God. I worship because he is original. I worship because he is the only God. I worship because he does not share his throne with no other. I worship him because he is everlasting. He always was. He always will be. I worship him because God never ceases to exist. He was here before time. He was always present. He was always omnipotent. He was always God. He was always sitting on the throne. He didn't become God yesterday. He didn't become God this morning because you felt good. Amen. It doesn't matter how you feel. God was God before you ever developed feelings before you were ever born. Isaiah said it in 6 and verse 1, and he looks, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. Let me work on you just a moment right here. When he saw the Lord, everybody said he had revelation. When Isaiah saw the Lord, the Bible says his what train filled the temple Every battle, every fight was in the presence of Isaiah when he was committing to a call. Read it in the word of God. He had been called, but now he's fixing to answer his call, and he has a revelation. I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I, I must declare, we must get a vision of God. We must see his sovereignty. We must see the beauty of his holiness. Well, I got all day. You amen me and I'll, go, I'll move on. You must see him in his attributes. 
You must see him in the midst of your frustration, but not God's frustration. The problem with some is that they never see the Lord. Mm, they, they don't stay in the altar long enough till they have revelation that the Lord is not low and defeated. He's high and lifted up. <laughs> they stay in an altar long enough to where they feel good, but that they don't feel good with revelation of God. Hey, man, I'm, I know I'm rough on you today, but I'm going to tell you. Hey, man, when Isaiah saw the Lord, he saw him high lifted up. And when he saw the Lord, he didn't see the Lord in defeat. He didn't see the Lord moping. He didn't see the Lord with a long face on him. No, sir. He saw the Lord in all of his triumph, in all of his power, in all of his glory. He saw the Lord in the low times. He saw the Lord in Isaiah's problem. He saw the Lord in Isaiah's battles. He saw the Lord in Jerusalem's conflict, in the reign of a king, in the fight of the Philistine army. He saw the Lord high and lifted up. I'm going to tell you, when you have a revelation of who God is, you can go to God. Goliath. You can go to a lion. You can go to a bear. But if you've never seen the Lord high and lifted up, you better stick with ants. Uh, you better stick with stumping caterpillars. Hey, Amen. But when you've got a revelation of who God is and you see him in his power and you see him in his sovereignty and you see him in his might, high and lifted up, every victory belongs to the Lord. Every power belongs to the Lord. Every might belongs to the Lord. I got somewhat against you apostolics. You proclaim the goodness of the Lord and quote Acts 2.38 and you get stuck in the infilling of the Holy Ghost and the baptism of Jesus' name and the oneness of God and you cannot have revelation of the oneness of God and miss his attributes. Let me say that again because some of you were sleeping and daydreaming and didn't want to hear it. You can't see God in oneness and not see him in his attributes. What's his attributes? Love. So if God is love, that means I can't look across the aisle and see my sister or my brother that ain't doing it the way that I think he ought to be doing it or she ought to be doing it. It is not a revelation. It's a lack of a prayer life. Falling back on your face before God and praying through. When you see the Lord high and lifted up in his train field, the, the temple, you don't see people's mistakes. Uh, amen. Because if you'll look in the mirror, he said, Get the beam. It means that huge, magnificent wood. Get that beam out of your eye, and then uh, uh, you can work on the moat, the little tiny dot that is in the neighbors. I found that people that are criticizing other saints of God have more problems than they ever recognize. they running down long tongue, gossiping, and cutting down the people that they come to worship God. Oh, my God. Young people make a mistake, well, bless God. Now, it's been said that somebody backslid over my daughter. Now, let me just tell you something. If somebody backslid over my daughter, they didn't have anything in the start. You don't backslide over somebody. You backslide, you backslide over a lack of revelation. You backslide because you didn't see the Lord high and lifted up. You backslide because you quit praying and seeking. You, you don't. You don't backslide because the preacher doesn't tell you everything. My God, if it backslide was, was on, dependent on somebody else, I wouldn't be preaching the gospel. I'm glad that my pastor come against me different times, even when I was right. I'm glad that my pastor challenged me because why? It made me dig deeper in my revelation and my walk with God and my knowledge of the attributes of God. Oh, y'all don't want to hear this today. The problem with some folks, they see denominations, but they don't see relationship. I go to the Pentecostal church. 
I'm not trying to be cute or ugly, but they're going to be 50% just statistics of Pentecostals that are going to split hell wide open. If you use the scenarios of the Word of God and those scenarios were two in the field, one taken, one left, two in a bed, one taken, one. If you use the scenarios, not everybody that claims to be Christian is Christian. Amen. I don't care how, how holy you are on the outside. If you're running down a young person, you're not holy on the inside. If somebody's offended you, you are not in Bible if you're running your tongue against them. The Bible says leave your gift at the altar. Hey, man, I've offended many, but praise God, I wish that somebody had the guts to come to me and let me make it right instead of go destroy me and try to kill me and try to bury a ministry and destroy the work of God. Now, you want me to stay in Acts? I can't do it. If you want me to stay on the Holy Ghost, just infilling of the Holy Ghost, it's wonderful and it's mandated and you gotta have it. But there are the attributes that every one of us have to get to. It's the love of God. It's the judgments of God. While I endorse our young people and I love you, I do not give you a license to sin. I do not give you a license to be worldly. I do not give you a license to be cornal. I'm in your side. I'm in your corner. I give you a license to pray and to have a revelation and to seek the face of God. When I fall, I shall arise. A wise man falls seven times. Jesus said, you know what, let's have this conversation while we're here. Seven times. Okay, let's deal with this. Let's multiply. And how many times am I supposed to forgive somebody that speaks ugly or does things wrong? It goes both ways. If somebody spoke against you, they were wrong. But if you get it in your spirit and you let it affect your walk with God, you're wrong. And two wrongs. Don't make a right. Jesus said, here's how you're going to do it. Let's calculate. Let's forgive seven times 70. Let's, let's occupy all the minutes of the day. Let's make sure that all of your activities of the day have a forgiveness for every minute that you're going to make a mistake, that you're going to fall on your face, and that you're going to say, oh, God, I want to I do better, but I messed up. Hear me, if you fall on your face, you repent, and you don't wait. You repent immediately. If you sin, you repent immediately. If you fall in a sin, you fall on your face and plead the blood and ask God to wash your sins white as snow. Oh, my, I'm long today. That's okay. You need it. I've never seen people come to church that want to go to hell I'm sorry if I'm on my way to hell it ain't church where I want to be I want to go to the honky tonks and I want to juke and jive and I want to have a party and I want to, I want to get some, some substitutes that'll make me feel a little different now, I said that. That ain't my handkerchief. That's my face. That's to hush me up. Y'all might want me to put that on, but I'm not right now. Not yet. I'll put it on after a while. <laughs> Folks that come to church deserve an opportunity for you to grant your mercy. They're not here just because they want to make you think they're spiritual. They're here to, they're trying, you're trying to get to heaven. You, every person that comes through this door has the desire to know more of God and to be saved. They're not here because they want to go to hell. They're not here because they want to be weak. They're not coming to church because they want to fall out with God. They're coming to the church because they need strength. They need help. They need knowledge. They need forgiveness. They need mercy. They need the grace of God. And I said that to say that we, the people of God, must get beyond acts and get to the attributes of God that there is a forgiving spirit. Spirit. You want revival. You don't have revival by fixing people before they ever get the Holy Ghost. You don't, you don't have revival by, by I, I'm going to tell you, I'm still not fixed. <laughs> I'm doing good, 
but I ain't fixed. Got my heart right most of the time. Know what I said most? Well, where am I at today? Ooh. You want to make a jab, you got to make sure that your spirit's right. There are ways to help people. Create in me a clean heart and a right spirit. Some of you have a clean heart and a wrong spirit. Some of you have a right spirit and a dirty heart. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to help one another. Don't misinform me. But when I'm hurting and I'm still trying to get to heaven, I don't need nobody cutting me open deeper. I'm just being honest with you. I need your prayers more then than I've ever needed them. These folks need your, you need one another's prayers more than, because you, as perfect as you may be in as best as you can, there are going to be some challenges in this week that's going to happen that you're going to need some assistance in life. There's going to be some seasons in your life to where you're going to run from, from uh, Jezebel. Even though you've got all revelation and all power, you're going to have a weakness in your spirit. And knowing that God has all victory, there will be a temptation to flee from the spirit of Jezebel. Now, just as Jezebel is a spirit of, of, of being, uh, let, me, let me phrase my word. I've got to be careful. I was almost going to be raw there. As being a woman of the night, as being a woman of ill repute, as being a woman of, of sexual immorality, all of these things. She's been a woman of all the makeup, all the world, and all ungodliness. She is also a woman that stones the prophet. We want to we want to preach on all of the makeup, and we leave the we leave the part. Of, God doesn't give you a license. There are some preachers I do not agree with in their doctrine, but I am not going to put my tongue against them. There are some preachers I don't agree with their standards in the same belief and the same denomination that we may be in, but I am not endorsed to put my tongue against them. The Bible says that harm not, do my prophets no harm. And so while I have to keep that balance, I don't know why I'm here, I, I, I have no idea. Amen, why I have to keep that balance, amen, ask for me in my house. My responsibility is right here at my church. Amen. We're going to preach holiness at my church. We're going to live separated at my church. But I'm not endorsed to run my brother down the street down or down the, the city down or down the country or down another state down. God didn't give me that endorsement. Amen. There may be some things they can get away with that I can't get away with. I don't know. I'm not God. But I know this, that God in his attributes, when I saw the Lord high lifted up, I saw the love of God. I saw the gentleness of God. I saw seen the mercy of God. I seen the grace of God. I seen the kindness of God. And that same God that washed me in my troubles, in my immorality, in my sins is the same God that must reach out to touch others. Oh, I got to hurry. Oh, let me just, no, I'm not. You better be careful mocking people how they worship. Now, now, my girls are released because they, they do some things in private. Let me explain. We have this little game when they were young. Now we're old. But they would shout like some of you. And we would have to determine who the character was that was the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Now, some of you going to make fun, some of you going to make fun of me, but we ain't watching TV. Well, I'll leave that alone real quick. And they're dancing and shouting and, and they're doing mannerisms. Uh, I can't do it. I, I'll give it away. I want to. We, we wanted to do it at a Christmas banquet, but I wouldn't allow it. <laughs> but it would have been so funny. We can be unique in our style of worship. But I'll never judge you if you're real or fake. The moment that I pick up the book of the judge, 
is the moment I become in danger of hellfire. The moment that I, oh, look, she's shouting over there. She probably got worldly music on her radio. What you got on yours? You see, we, but because, because somebody, and we're against worldly music. Let me just fix that. Just because somebody's listening, and I'm against it, listening to worldly music here, and they're over here gossiping and running down somebody else, just because the, the phrases are different, they're both sin. Now, you're missing that. They're both sin. Just because this one's got her skirt too, too, too high, and this one over here, has got their attitude that is so rotten. Sin is sin. I'm going to tell you what the Lord been dealing with me. He said, you better be careful not to get caught up on the outside alone. You've got to have it. Now, you're gonna, some of you are already going to town on it. You're writing your book. You better not get caught up on the outside alone and miss the leading of the Spirit on the inside. Because there's a lot of things that mimic Christianity that are the devil themselves. Oh, man, how did I get here today? Mother-in-law, I really am a good preacher sometimes. <laughs> Be careful. Some of you are too quiet in the prayer room. Some of you are too loud. Keep praying. Well, don't get quiet. You're going to fit in between the sound barrier. <laughs> Some of you are too spiritual. Some of you are not spiritual enough. Some of you are very holy. Some of you are not holy enough. Some of you pray three hours a day and gossip five hours a day. Some of you pray five minutes a day but loves everybody. I'm not favoring either. Please don't, don't let my analogy make you think that I'm favoring one. I'd rather you pray three hours and love everybody. There's got to be a balance in Christianity, folks. God is more than an Acts 2.38 God. And before Isaiah was endorsed to do his thing, God mandated him to see God in his fullness. If you're only seeing God in Acts 2.38, you're going to be all over the scale in your walk with God. If you only see God when you feel good and the weather's right and the sun's right and the moon's right, you're going to be unbalanced in your walk with God. Your walk with God must be con consistent, church. You pray when you feel like it, and you pray when you don't feel like it. You live for God when you feel like it, and you live for God when you don't feel like it. You come to church when things are bad, and you come to church when things are good. You come to church when the pastor gets out of his way and finally meets you and shakes your hand, or when the pastor missed you for a month. You are consistent. Your, your walk with God is not predicated upon the constituents of the house of God. Your walk with God is predicated upon your revelation of God, not just to quote the one God, God manifested in the flesh. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Your revelation of God must consist of his attributes, his love, his power, his might, his mercy, his grace, and let me add in his judgment. To some of you that think you can get away with fooling around in whatever territory you can, there is judgments of God. And the judgments of God are real. And so you cannot exclude out of the attributes of God what you favor and what you dislike. They're all inclusive. Can't cut the pie and pick the piece you like. It ain't when they run the pizza, and if you like me, I'll pick the biggest piece because I'm greedy. And the rest of you need to repent. I thought I'd get some amens. You know you're looking for that big piece too. 
I love going to restaurants with people and you have a, a, an appetizer. And there's one left. There's only one, one, one piece left and, and, and everybody's all, they're eyeing it. Everybody wants it. You want that? No, you're lying. You can ask them all. You can ask them all. They're everyone, no, oh, no, no, you go ahead. Brother. Everybody's desiring to have it. You can't pick and choose in your walk with God. Your walk with God is a balance. It's not because Susie does you good or Henry does you bad or, or the boss pays you well or the government tax you too much or, or your politician was not elected. or It has nothing to do. Honey, your walk with God is based upon a revelation. I saw the Lord. Now, I, I'm trying to hurry. I'm not even close, but I'm trying to hurry. John has this vision and this revelation. God's taking him. After all, you know, he was riding on a train of triumph. He had his crown. He come in. All the horses. No, he was Alipat. He didn't been duck, dunked in the ball and oil. Was he a Christian? Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, uh, what kind of Christian was he? He must, he must have had sin in his life. So all the others that were decapitated, crucified, and went through the trials and tribulations. So John gets this revelation. God pulls him up. He gets into this. He sees the, the stones. He sees the, it's as a mirror of a river when he gets to the throne. He's overwhelmed at his view and his vision. Let me help you. You're going to appreciate when these gentlemen say, let's worship the Lord. He gets this vision, and he sees one sitting on the throne. But on that throne, <laughs> on that throne was 24 elders. Those 24 elders were present when John was pulled up to quote, to record. Now, there are things you know not of. There are spiritual happenings that you are oblivious to and you have no mental capability of processing the greatness thereof. He sees four beasts on that throne. One of those beasts, is, the Bible says, is like a lion. But he gives, he gives the finality of the description on the tail end that is mesmerizing. He says the second another resembles, he, he, he looks, like, looks like an eagle. He said the third, the third one that there, he appears like a calf. And he says the fourth beast is like a man. And he says, these creatures, these beasts have eyes everywhere. Does that spook you yet? And John sees this. Apparently, John sees the book too. And in the presentation of his vision, the emphasis must have been put upon the book but had not been drawn in the full conclusion of the word of God just as it continues. And he, he looks and he sees, he sees these 24 elders that, I'll, I'll give my interpretation, that does not mean it's full biblical. I can draw it from the 12 gates of the disciples. I can, I can draw it through the 12 foundations of, 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 of the forefathers. But there are 24 elders that are sitting on the throne too. you got to get this. If I can have your, your attention for the next 15, 10 minutes, 5 minutes. They have a, the elders have a, a crown of gold which is signifying they are authority. And John looks again and he sees these 24 elders... He already sees the four beasts that are all seeing from all angles. 
that are worshiping God continually, nonstop. You talk about the angels worshiping God, but you don't say anything about the beast. They are worshiping, I'm, I know I'm a little, probably too deep maybe. They're worshiping God in the process the elders are moved by the atmosphere. The elders reposition themselves from the throne. They come down from the throne. And apparently there are depths and they come to the throne they take their crown and put it that John see in this they put their crown at the feet of the king they're worshiping I'm gonna tell you why if if the 12 tribes of Israel if I'm correct the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel, and if the 12 apostles of the New Testament, 12 of the old and 12 of the new can merge in an authoritative state of reigning with God on the throne, and they come down, they remove their accolades, they remove their authority, they remove all of their glory and all of their credit. And you know what they do? They come down to where the king is, and they they put it down and they begin to John seeing at all. Hey, I want to tell you if the if the, the if the patriarchs of the Old Testament, oh, they're around the throne worshiping God. If the disciples of the New Testament are worshiping God, who are we, the people of God, that come to church, have revelation, have knowledge, have understanding of this great God? Some of you stay on your throne too much. Let's stand. I, I, I'm in trouble. I got way more than I'm than you're you're ready to handle. I'm gonna tell you what'll fix your gossip and your lust. I'm gonna tell you what'll fix your bad attitude and your wrong spirit. If you have one, I'm going to tell you what will what what fix. I'm offended. If you're offended, let me tell you what's going to fix it. Get off your high horses. Get off that throne. God's honored you. You're the priesthood. I can prove it. I'm going to hold out a lot. You're a priesthood. You've got accolades. You've got, you've got some glory and some power, and you've got some might that you grant. That's what, the, that's what the elders did. They came and they, what they had and what they were given in the process of time and what they have uh, arrived in their, their development of relationship and knowledge and experience, they brought with them to the throne. And when they got to the throne, they brought it down to the feet of Jesus. And you know what they done with it? Because it's where it all comes from anyway. They put it where it belonged, at the feet of Jesus. And John's perplexed. He's troubled. Who's going to open this book? Revelation. John, in all of his vision, had a hindrance and a delay of revelation. Until... In all of his walk with God, he walked with God based upon his perception. He never fed his lack of perception. He never opened up his mind to pray and ask God to, to teach him and to lead him in knowledge that he did not possess. Is this okay? He, he never came to God and sought God. You know, you know we're, 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 we might be smart, but we don't have it all, church. He never came to God in that aspect, obviously, because he would have not acted it out. Some of you lack. He said, if you lack, let him ask. If any of you among lack wisdom, let him ask. There are some things that I am constantly asking God for. 
Church, you have no idea the revival that God wants to give this church. I'm not, that's not a phrase. That's a fact. You have no comprehension of the power of God that wants to be demonstrated in these altars. You would be flabbergasted by the demonstration. And you say, well, Pastor, what do you mean? John, who's worthy to open the book? Who's worthy? Who's going to open a book? He was crying until, that's why you need an elder in your life, until the elder said, now calm down, son. <laughs> there is one who is mighty. <laughs> Woo! There's one that from the tribe of Judah. There is one who is Alpha and Omega. There is one from the beginning to the end. <laughs> Woo! Hey, hold on, sir. John, we're glad that you had a teleprompt and you came down and you had a transformation. However you got here, hold on for a moment. Let us worship the one who is worthy. Man, did you see how good I preached? Man, you should have been here Tuesday. You did good. Man, did you see how good I, I done Tuesday? Man, I had them eating out of the palm of my Man, I worked them. Man, I had them working, man. They were worshiping. Hey, man, you didn't see, you didn't see the 12 tribes of Judah. You didn't see the, the leaders and the patriarchs that are gathered around. Man, look what I done for God. Man, I led those 144,000. Man, look, boy, we were there in that wilderness. And man, God, began. I touched the bread. I touched the bread. No, honey. They put everything aside because they understand. Worthy is the Lamb of God. You don't have a sin problem. You have a revelation problem. You don't have a walk with God problem. You've got a revelation problem because all you see is God, but you miss his attributes. Hey, friend, you've got to understand that the Lord, number one, is high. You've got to understand that he's lifted up, and you've got to understand that he is filled with victory. It doesn't matter what you're going through. He's already had the victory. It doesn't matter what fault you had. He's already got deliverance. It doesn't matter what penalties you're facing. He's already got grace for you. He's got mercy for you. It doesn't matter what you're deceived in. God's got knowledge and understanding for you. If you will have a revelation, if you'll take the time to spend with the Lord. That's why we've been promoting worship the last several weeks. That's why we've been telling you when you come to church, hey, man, we don't come defeated. If you come defeated, that means that you don't understand who God is, and we need a Bible study. I, I, I know you have some tough times. I know you have some losses in life. I know you have some not-so-good days. I know you don't feel good every day, but it doesn't change that he's God. The revelation of his attributes will make you love everybody equally. My wife said something so powerful. Let me see if I can say it. I know how to say it. Let me see if it, I'm, I'm pro, sometimes I say things too soon and it affects other things. You know what I'm talking about. Just be careful. <laughs> That's that knowledge I've been praying for. <laughs> She said, we treat pretty people better. She was speaking of humanity. Not me, not us, not the church. She was talking about in the workforce. She was talking about being kinder, being easier forgiven. Well, it was a scenario that was a quite, uh, quite an interesting scenario. And she said, folks have the tendency to be more merciful to people that are pretty. It's just reality. That's why everybody's so kind to me. 
Hold on. <laughs> Listen to me. Before you go further in your walk with God, before Isaiah was sent on his mission, read it, study it out. He had to have a full understanding of who we serve and who we serve, what it entails of what who we serve can do. If who you serve can't do for you, you're in trouble. If who you serve you cannot trust your will or your future with, you're in trouble because not that God is not able, but because you are limited on your ability to perceive. I hope I'm not too deep. On your ability to perceive what God can do. And so the limit of perception will cause you to react. You will, you will prematurely move in a direction that is contradicting the will of God because you have not had full comprehension of the hand of God. I'm trying to help you today. I'm challenging you to start praying that God will let you discern him for who he is. We, we proclaim revelation, but I got to I got to confess, we don't have revelation. When we walk into service, service after service, and we're pouting and we're moaning and we're groaning and we're complaining, I'm guilty, I'm involved, I'm included. When all we talk about is our downs and not talking about the goodness of God. Let me ask you a question. Did John record any? Did any of the 24 that were on the throne transferred to the feet of the throne? Did he record any of them, man? I can't believe I went through that trial and it was so ugly and it was so bad. There's something about the totality of God. There is something about the fullness of God's power that just puts everything out of the way. And all you see is the genuine glory of God. You know what we need? You know why it's important to worship? You know why? Amen. Because it puts you in a position to let God be God. The number one priority for you to worship God is that it removes your impurities. That's why the woman, that's why Jesus brought the woman at the well. That's why he brought her past up so he could deal with her past and so they could remove that out the way so it won't hinder the progress of her revelation. Mm. They, they call me to preach camp meetings and general conferences. <laughs> Jesus. Let's come, let's come around the front. Our bickering, our insecurities, our frailness, our flaws, our weaknesses, and our brokenness. God, help me see. I wish, I don't know what, what happened to John. I don't know the fullness of the message of John. I know some of his writings. I wish for a moment that I'm not going to refer to the Samaritan's temple as the woman at the well. But when she had that encounter with the Messiah, that all, the past all changed. Everything became new. Listen to me. This day forward, it's finished. If you got ought against your brother, it's over. I'm going to say it again. If you got ought against your brother, it's over. If you got a problem with your sister, it's over. If it continues, you need to come and see me. If you got a problem with the way somebody prays, somebody worships, somebody leads, somebody, it doesn't, it's over. And let's worship God together. In His holiness. In His oneness. In His attributes. In his goodness. 
Come on, anything you've done, it's over. Anything you failed at, it's over.